chapter 2 and Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 2, just verse 15, we read these words. He who Jews by nature, sorry, he who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, by the works of the law, no man shall be justified. Verse 19, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Then chapter 4 and verses 1 to 7. And I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave. He is the master of all. But under the guardians and stewards, under the guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And just a few verses from Exodus and chapter 20, which is really the beginning of the, the Ten Commandments. The first three verses says this, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. That was the first commandment that God gave. You shall have no other gods before me. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray together. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this renewed privilege and opportunity of gathering with those of like mind today. We thank you that we can come to worship you. We believe that you're a God who draws near to us, a God who is present with those who want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we're thankful, Lord, that you're not just a God who is everywhere, but a God who draws near to his people and a God who by his Holy Spirit works within the hearts and the lives of his people. We thank you for your spirit that helps us to understand your word, which we pray you will be gracious to us this day and help us to apply it to our own hearts and to our own lives. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you that it was in the fullness of time that he came into this world. You didn't send an angel. You didn't send a prophet. You sent your only begotten Son into this world so that he could die on behalf of people like ourselves. And he could enable us to be reconciled to you, a holy God. And so we come in his name. We have no other means by which we can approach you but through him and all that he has achieved on our behalf. So, we come to give you praise this day. We ask that you cause our hearts to be lifted up in praise and adoration of our God. We ask again that you'll be with those that cannot be with us. You'll bless them and minister to them in their particular situations. We thank you for those you've returned to us. We thank you for Muriel being with us even this day. We pray that you will encourage your soul as she's able again to at least be near to your church as she comes to gather with us. And Father, we just pray again for our land. We are listening to the news and we can be easily depressed and downcast if we did not believe that you're the God who is working out his purposes. And we pray in our land when all these things are going on, it may be a time where they may yet be a turning to yourself. Pray wherever your, your word is preached this day, whether it be on the internet or whether it be in public domain, we pray that you will bless and you will have your hand upon those that present it. Continue with us then and bless us, we ask, in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're looking at this section that I read together, really, from, from Exodus and chapter, chapter 3. Um, it's an unusual service. I mean, we don't sing uh, um, a vast amount of hymns, but we do sing at least three. And not to be able to sing, it's, it kind of changes the service quite a bit. But central to the service should always be the Word of God. So if we find that all we like to do is singing and all we like to do is, well, we come actually to learn and to know something of God. So we need His Word and we need to be encouraged by it. So we're thinking about the Word of God again this morning. We're going to really introduce, oops, there's my watch gone, introduce um, 
introduce the law today, the, the Ten Commandments. That's where we're at today. We're going to be looking at God's law over the next uh, number of weeks, really, and um, thinking about the children of Israel. Remember, they were led out of Egypt by Moses. They come out of slavery. And now we find they've deli been delivered, and they begin their journey through the wilderness. So they've got some hard times ahead of them. They're going to spend a few months now at this Mount Sinai where, where, where Moses first met with God uh, at the burning bush. And he's going to reveal something of his, of his will and his purpose and his character and his love towards his people. So he's going to spend that time um, doing that over these next days and weeks and months. And they're going to understand something of the character of God, that he's a holy God. They can't just approach God in the way they want or how they feel. God has to be approached in a particular way. And so in chapter 9, we reminded ourselves that indeed God had revealed himself and he'd come close to his people by grace. It wasn't because they were a special people. It wasn't because they were more than any other nation. God expressed his love to these people in a way which just displays that God is a God who gives love and mercy to those who don't deserve it. But also what he requires is obedience. He, he requires us to be those who obey what he says. Now, we live in an age, I believe, which is not the best of ages for wanting to be told what to do. We, we live in, a, in an age when people resent authority often, don't they? Joel comes up with some wonderful stories now he's in the police in Cardiff. The, the, the way in which he's spoken to and the way in which he's reacted to. Well, years ago, when a policeman was in the vicinity, you were very careful how you spoke to him. Because in those days, they could even give you a clip in the ear, I suppose. But... but Authority isn't the same now as it once was. It's, it's, it's not respected as we perhaps would have thought in days gone by. People don't like rules, but if you've got no rules, then you've got problems. If you've got no rules in society, then you've got a problem. If you've got no rules in a school, well, there's chaos. If you've got no rules in your house, then, then you've, got, you've got mayhem. So rules are, are vital. If you haven't got rules, the only ones who survive are those who are the strongest. So rules are supposed to be there for our good, and for our betterment. Now, the law of God, which we're going to be thinking about over these weeks, the law of God was never given to be our means of salvation. Because of this, none of us here today, and I'm confident of this, doesn't matter how long you feel you've been a Christian, how mature you are, how, none of us today actually live in the way that we should. None of us are perfect. None of us actually keep God's law perfectly. So, God has given us his law, and he's given it to us for, for our good and for the good of society. Now, I believe the law of God was given as a bedrock for our, for our own laws, for, our, for the good of society. It was given for the good of the church, for, for religious uh, reasons, but it was also given for the good of society. The laws were not just given for Israel, for the people who were at Mount Sinai. The law wasn't just given for the Old Testament people. The law of God, especially the Ten Commandments, were given for the good of all. And he requires and he points us to himself and he's showing us we cannot keep this law. This is why he would have to send his son in the fullness of time. And when we follow the, the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry, what we begin to find is that Jesus actually was the only one we could say kept the law perfectly. There were some great men, John the Baptist, Elijah. Moses, David, the great men, but they were none of them were perfect. Jesus Christ kept the law of God perfectly, and he conformed to everything that God would have him to conform to. And yet, he says, if you could conform to the law, then you may keep the law outwardly, but often inwardly there's a problem. So Jesus says, doesn't he? You know, if you don't commit adultery, that's commendable, because you shouldn't commit adultery. But he actually says, you can commit adultery in your hearts. If you've never murdered anybody, I don't think anybody's murdered anybody here. But if you've never murdered anybody, so that's commendable. But you may well have hated a person in your heart, which really is like as if you've murdered that person. So Jesus actually pushes the law a little bit further and says that it's more than just rules. It's about our heart. So as we begin to look at the Ten Commandments, we'll see they were good for all. They were good for the whole of man and mankind. But it's vital to understand this. That a man is, or woman is not justified by the law. Now that word justify, it comes up again and again in the Bible. And unless we understand it, we've got a problem. To be justified means it's just as if you had never sinned. And that puts us in a problem, doesn't it? Because we've all sinned. 
But to be justified means as if in the sight of God, we've never sinned. So Galatians chapter 2, which we read, verse 16, it says, A man is not justified by the works of the law, by the Ten Commandments. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we have believed on Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, for the works of the law, or by the works of the law, no man can be justified. So the Apostle Paul says, God's given us the law, but you can't be right with God by just keeping the law, because God wants perfection, and we're not going to do it, we're not going to make it. The Christian is someone, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 21, we no longer live, but we no longer li live as we once lived, but by faith in Jesus Christ, who now lives within us. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might know the righteousness of God in him. So, the law of God, to be justified, you will not get justified by keeping the rules. We will not be accepted by God by making sure we keep the Ten Commandments because we cannot do it. And what, Paul, what the New Testament shows us, James chapter 1 and verse 22 verse to verse 25, actually gives us an illustration. That what is the law for then? What does the law do? Well, it tells us in, in James chapter 1, it says, here's an illustration. The law of God is like a mirror. Now, when you look at your mirror, and as you get older, you don't look in the mirror quite so long. I always remember a fellow preaching to me when I was a youngster saying, you know what it is when you're young, you always pass a window, shop window, and you look in the window, and you just check your hair. But as you get older, you don't look in the window, because you don't want to be looking in the mirror too long, do you? I, I got no idea what I looked like, but I was in church this morning in the service, and an old gentleman came up to me and he said, has anyone ever said to you, you look like Donald Trump? I said, no, nobody's ever said I look like Donald Trump. So I don't know whether it was supposed to be a compliment or an insult, though I don't know what it was, but... You know what it is when we've got a mirror, we look in the mirror, and as we get older we don't look so much, but we look in the mirror, and it reveals to us the problems we've got. It reveals the lines, but it also reveals the, the mess we may have on our face. If the lady's got lipstick on, it may not be sat quite right. So when we look in a mirror, it reveals to us the problems that we have. And so, the law of God is like that. It's like a mirror. We look into the mirror, and it reveals to us what we really are. It shows us our problems. It sh the problem with the mirror is it can't s clean the face. It can't remove the lipstick or what have you. Only God, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, only God can cleanse us and make us alive spiritually and acceptable to him. Only God can do that. The mirror cannot do that. The word of God, just reading the Bible, just knowing the Ten Commandments, cannot do it. So the law was sent with the purpose of showing us that we cannot keep the law of God ourselves. To enter the family of God, <coughs> God sends his son to redeem us, to, to buy us back, to pay the penalty that, for the laws that we've broken, if you want. That's why he came. He came and he fulfilled the law of God. He obeyed it perfectly. And therefore, when he dies in our stead, we can say, well, he actually did keep the law perfectly. So the law, the Ten Commandments, are they relevant today? Well, Jesus says these words, but if you love me, you will keep or seek to keep my commandments. We won't be perfect, but we'll ask God's grace every day to obey him and to follow him. Whoever loves me, whoever uh, who trusts in me, whoever is in my family says will keep my commandments. We seek to do the will of the Father. Those who are his true followers seek to obey him. Now, when we get to the illustration of the mirror, we think of the, the illustration that he gives there with, the, with regard to the mirror, and we know that it, doesn't, it, isn't, able to, it isn't able to be able to, to clean our face, but it reveals to us the problem that we have. Moses, on the mountain, He's gone up to see God. God has spoken to him. He's, he's revealed himself. Moses has spoken to the people. Remember, he's over 80 years of age. He's been up and down the mountain a few times. But now when we come to verse 1 of Exodus chapter 20, God actually speaks to him, doesn't it? speaks to the people. God comes and he shows Moses that he is the one now who is going to speak. Tell the people to listen. So they hear God's voice. 
and they tremble in the very presence of God. We often talk about not knowing the will of God. How do I know what is right in my life? How do I know what to do? There are certain things we, we struggle over. But to know the will of God, we need to know the word of God. We need to know God's commands. He tells us what he expects of us. That's why the Ten Commandments is still relevant to us even today. So we pray. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, don't we? We pray, thy will be done. What will thy will be? Thy will will be obeying God, who is now speaking at that mountain. And God sets out clearly in verse 2. He commands, he says this. I'll tell you who's telling you these words. It isn't Moses. I am the Lord your God. They knew who was speaking them. He wanted to stress to them, this is from God himself, the words that they were hearing. He's the one who's going to rule over them. Now, as I said at the beginning, many of us don't react well to authority, do we? He says, you belong to me. I bought you. And the Lord is going to apply all that he says. He says, I'm applying it to you. That's my people, to you individually. I'm your father. And what I'm telling you now, I expect you to obey. I'm laying down the rules. You may not be perfect, but here's the rules. Now I've got, you know I've got six children. They're not perfect children, but over the years, I like to think generally they wanted to obey their parents. Why? Well, as they got older, they weren't frightened of me. But as they got older, they wanted to obey their parents because hopefully they, sh they respect and they love their parents. Now, they weren't perfect, but they would have wanted to obey us. I'm, I'm sure of that. So how much more should the children of God who have come to faith, who have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ, how much more should we want to obey God? So verse 2, the Jews, he had saved them. The Jews, he paid the price to get them out of, out of Egypt. They come out of the misery, they come out of the pain, and now their position was changed. Remember, they were slaves. Now they may not be in the best position in the wilderness, but now at least they are free. So they're released. It's a wonderful picture of the Christian. The Christian is someone who doesn't matter how terrible their lives have been, and some of us may have lived terrible lives, doesn't matter how badly we've sinned, and some of us may have done some terrible things we'd never want to tell anybody about. The Christian is someone who has actually come and put their faith in Christ, and he's delivered them out of that, that position they were in, that slavery to sin. How did it happen? Well, Paul tells us in, in Ephesians 2, it was by grace, it wasn't deserved, it was favor they did not deserve, it was by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it was a gift of God. It was not of works, said Paul. It wasn't by trying to keep the Ten Commandments, because if it was of works, you may have been able to boast of it. You were created in Christ Jesus. What were you created for? You were created for good works, which God pre prepared before this world began, that he would want us to walk in. So Paul says, you've been saved by grace, not by works, but by faith in God. So the Ten Commandments, they, lose, they do lay down responsibilities for us. We've entered into the family of God if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. They are there to guide us, to direct us, and have us to obey him out of love now and out of gratitude. When you take the Ten Commandments, you get the first four commandments. They really tell us about how we should act towards God. And in the next six commandments, actually what they do is, they tell us because we love God and we put our faith in him, we will act in a certain way towards our fellows. If we get the first four right, there's every chance we'll get the next six something like right. How do we relate to others? It will depend really on how our relationship is with God. If we love God, if we obey him, we will love our neighbors. We will want to serve others. We will want to serve others despite all our deficiencies. Love the Lord your God, says Jesus, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. I'm not going to tell you what the, what the Lord requires. And then he says, if you do that, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's the two that sum up the commandments. So the mirror is an example. You look into the word of God. You say, I'm far short of what I should be. 
And then God says, yes, but I provided a means to make you right with me. That's why I sent my son. And then he gives another example. He tells us there that not only is the word of God, the commandment, like a mirror, it's like a teacher. It's like a teacher. It, it comes and it shows us, it teaches us that God is holy and we are far from what we should be. And it tells us what God requires. And a good teacher, I would imagine the, the two teachers over there could tell us, but a, a good teacher would be able not only to give you the problem, but be able to tell you how to solve the problem. That's what the Word of God does. That's what God does. He, the, the commandments show us our problems, and what they do is they point us to the answer to the problem. You know, you have the equation, whatever, and then you have equals, there's the answer. Here's the problem, Ten Commandments, can't keep them. Here's the answer. Jesus Christ was sent to keep them for us. And faith in Him, and trust in Him, means that we can be accepted before God, not because of us, but because of Him. So God gives a law as a mirror to reveal our sin, to show us that can't do anything of itself. We need God to move in our hearts. He's given it to us as a teacher that will show us that we have an answer. But the answer he points to is Jesus Christ himself. And the law has also been given for the good of society. It informs our conscience. It tells us what is right and what is wrong. In this land, our laws in the past were founded upon the Ten Commandments. They were the means of restraining wickedness and evil. Unfortunately, many of the, a number of the laws are being changed, aren't they? And I'm always amazed when they change the laws and things get a little bit worse, you'd think someone would say, well, you know, perhaps we've slackened things off too much. Well, they don't. They go and slacken a little bit more. Perhaps give them a little bit more freedom, a little bit more tolerance, if you want. And what happens is society degenerates. They downgrade and society degenerates. But it was given to direct us, especially those who are the people of God, to be true followers of him. And what God requires of us is to be those who use it as our guide and our, comp our compass. So, the Lord of God, it's like a mirror. The Lord of God, it's, it's like a teacher. It was given so that it would be for the good of society. And it was that means whereby God could direct his people. We obey him. Why do we obey the law? Because when we come to faith in God and we understand the gospel and we understand that Jesus died for our sins, we want to follow Jesus Christ. We used to sing a chorus years ago, and I can't remember all the words, but it went something like this. I want to follow Jesus Christ all the days I live of my life on, here, on earth to give to him complete control of body and of soul. Follow him, follow him. Yield your life to him. He has conquered sin he is king of kings. And give to him complete control of body and of soul. Now I may have added a little bit wrong, but that's the drift of the, this chorus. Is that we actually are those now who want to follow him, to yield our lives to him. Why obey the Lord? God says in verse 2, because I am God and I said it. I am your father. Why do Christians obey the word of God and the law of God? They understand John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God demonstrated his love to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. So in him we have forgiveness of sins. In him we have redemption. We're brought back to God. In him we're set free from the captivity that we were once in sin. So the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not suggestions. They give them that term, commandments. We may not like to be commanded, but the commandments is what they are. And what he says in the first commandment is this, and I'm going to go very quickly. No one or nothing else should take priority over God. I'll repeat that. No one or nothing else should take priority over God in our lives. The first commandment is fundamental to all the others. There should be no other object of worship in our lives except the Lord God. That means nothing should ever surpass him in allegiance and in our love and in our devotion. Whether it's our money, whether it's pleasure, whether it's our careers, even if it's our families, nothing should supersede his presence in our life. No other gods, he says, before me. In other words, no opposition 
before me. And from the beginning, this has been the battle. Other gods have been raised up in people's lives, in our lives, I'm sure. He's saying, he's not saying, I should say, you may not have other gods, or you may, may have many gods, but I'm the one to be in charge. He's saying, no other gods, no competition. I will not give my glory to another, he says in Isaiah. You see, we were made for worshipping God. That's what we were made for. We were Worshipping God was what mankind was made for. If we don't worship God, I will guarantee you we will worship something else or someone else. What's actually happened, we're told in Romans, that some have come and they worshipped the creature rather than the creator. What holds precedence in our lives? What's the most important thing in our life is what he's saying. He reminds us that if that important thing is taken away, then our lives are empty. Now, you probably, if you follow any sport, you'll know that there are people who come to the end of their career. They've been top players in rugby or football or tennis. Or I, I, I often think of Bjorn Borg. He was such a quiet gentleman playing tennis, never heard him shout or rant, seemed totally calm. And he came to the end of his life when he finished his career and his life was really messed up. And a lot of these stars, they get to the end of their, their fame and fortune and they stop and they suddenly feel this huge void in their lives because th what they once thought was all and everything in life, they can't do it anymore. Now, a person who becomes a Christian, they places their trust in Jesus Christ. They've entered into a relationship with God through him. He has become our bridegroom. When you go back to your wedding days, if you can remember him, you can remember your wedding day, we made vows, didn't we? We made vows before God, before the congregation, and before the one we were going to marry. We had said, we will love, comfort, honor in sickness and in health. And then it says this, forsaking all others. The priority is the one now that we're marrying. That's the one that we should now live for. And like in marriage, God is saying in the beginning of the commandments, here's the commitment. Your maker is your husband, Isaiah 54, verse 5. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And Jesus Christ gave himself for us so that we, he could call us his own. Forsaken all by faith, we cling to him. You, in the singular, you shall have no other God beside me. Following Moses is a great leader, a man called Joshua. Joshua says to the people when they're entering the promised land, he says, listen, you need to choose this day who you will serve. And they all said, yeah, we'll save the Lord. Joshua gives them a reality check and says, no, you won't, for you have not, but you have learned to serve other gods. Now, we may never have set up a, a little icon on our on our mantelpiece or on our dressing table we may not have set up a shrine that we bow down to every night when we go to bed but he's talking about divided loyalties here it's god's way or it's no way jesus says you cannot serve god and mammon we live in an age of multi-faiths and we, we we accept people of different views and we want to live at peace with people as much as it's humanly possible but we never forget the Christian message says there is one God and there is one way to God and that is through Jesus Christ. And in a world which won't accept absolute truth, well, they're going to struggle with being commanded what God requires of people. He would say to us, who do we delight in most? most? Who do we love most? Who do we desire most? What takes up most of our thinking and most of our time? He says there will be no other gods. In Romans, Paul says this. What you learn to do as a Christian is to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that's only your reasonable service. So, Jesus Christ, if we believe he's the Son of God, if we put our faith in him, we've been justified not by what we do and who we are. We've been justified by faith in him as if we've never sinned because he never sinned and we trust in what he has done for us. Then if we are those, we want to follow him. 
He introduced the law and he said, but this Bible is going to be important. These commands are vital. They're going to be like a mirror. They're going to reveal your problems. They're going to be like a teacher who will show you your problems, but also show you the answer, who is Jesus Christ. And we are to be those who obey God's law because of what he has done for us in his son. Nothing, no one else should take precedence or priority over him. Amen. We're going to try another hymn now.